Okay. All right. So here we go. Starting with the definition. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're, we're, we're not just teaching you convocal today. We're teaching you, or today, this week, we're, we're going to try to do this in, the, in a quantitative way. Um, and very simply, quantitative microscopy is just thinking about your microscope, not just as an instrument to form an image, but an instrument that will form an image that you can make measurements on. And those measurements actually be meaningful. And so when we say a measurement is meaningful, what do I mean by that? So this is a very general concept that, um, that again, you may already understand this, but just to make sure we're all clear on it, when you make a measurement, any kind of measurement, not just a microscopy measurement, but any kind of measurement, you want that measurement to be both accurate and precise, right? And so our little target here, this is supposed to be a target and a bullseye, um, is, is representative of, of these two concepts because they are different. Accuracy is the agreement between the measurement that you make and the ground truth. So the ground truth is just like the reality, what's actually on that slide, right? Um, and precision <clears throat> is the uncertainty or the repeatability of the measurement. So in other words, of course, whenever you make a measurement, you're not gonna make it once, you're gonna make it multiple times. Right, and so imprecision is when you make that measurement, how confident can you be that that individual measurement is accurate? Right? Um, and so in our bullseye here on the left, we have a measurement that is imprecise. We've got one accurate measurement, one hit the bullseye there, but any one of those individual measurements, because we don't know the ground truth behind it, we can't be terribly confident that it's correct, right? On uh, in the middle, we have a very precise measurement, but it's wrong, it's inaccurate. And then on the right, we've got both, right? We've got accuracy and precision. So that's what we'd like to do. And it's important to think about this because microscopes are a source of both inaccuracy and imprecision. Just to really hammer this home. Let's say that the ground truth of whatever this measurement you're making is, is 100.00. And you make your multiple measurements and you look at those measurements and you get 150 plus or minus 0 0.01. So that is a really precise measurement, but it's wrong, right? It's just not correct. Um, so in that case, what that generally means is there's some sort of systematic error that your measuring instrument is introduced. And so it's the case with every measuring instrument and the case with microscopy that there are potential sources of inaccuracy, systematic errors that we can identify and correct for, right? So if, it's, if we add 50 to our measurement every time, we can identify that that's, that's the inaccuracy, we can subtract it, for example. This measurement, plus or minus 50, we've got an accurate um, average here, but a huge variance. And so that one's imprecise. Um, and again, the problem here is, with, with, there's multiple problems with imprecision, but one of them is the confidence with which you can um, view an individual measurement within your pool of measurements. Noise is generally the problem that is going to, uh, that we're gonna need to address when it comes to imprecision. Imprecision is really tricky in biology though, because your ground truth is rarely 100.00. There's gonna be some variation that is actually there in the biology. So the understanding the fundamentals of microscopy so that you can parse out what is the noise, uh, hopefully be able to parse out what is the noise and what is the actual variation in the biology. And so that, that's a sort of concept you have to be thinking about whenever you're making measurements with a microscope. I like to say this in every microscopy course I teach. Now this is very obvious, but I want you to think about it. You never get to see your specimen. You only ever get to see an image of your specimen that is generated by the microscope. Right, and and we and the microscope has sources of inaccuracy and imprecision, and so <clears throat> because of that, 
you constantly have to be worried about whether the measurement that you're making actually does represent the ground truth. And if you're not paying attention to this stuff, there's a very good chance that you're going to have a source of inaccuracy or a source of imprecision that's compromising your measurements. All right, so the bulk of this lecture is gonna be go going over fundamental concepts, three of them. You've probably all heard these terms, um, maybe have a good understanding of them, but um, again, I'll go through them carefully, make sure I could, you have a hopefully thorough understanding and um, in the context of microscopy. And so those are resolution, I know you've all heard of that one. Um, signal to noise ratio, my favorite, and uh, sampling. So just a few slides on that concept. All right, so we'll start with resolution. First, a definition, because we often hear people use resolution when they actually really mean signal to noise ratio. And so there is, <laughs> heard that happen, seen that happen. Um, and there is a relationship, so we'll get to that. But resolution, the definition of resolution is in your sample, there are the reality is the ground truth is there are two objects that are distinct from one another. And resolution is in the image of the object, can you distinguish those two objects as separate, or sorry, the image generated by the microscope, can you distinguish those two objects as separate from one another? And there's an example here. This is nature's perfect test specimen for resolution. It's a diatom and they have a silica shell with pores in it. And the pores are very regularly spaced, right? And this is just a, a DIC image, different, differential interference contrast, not fluorescence, but the concept is uh, true for, for all imaging, uh, all microscopy. Um, and so just putting a little uh, uh, square or yeah, rectangle around <laughs> and, and blowing it up where you can see that we can see some amount of something going on there, right? But if I increase the resolution of the microscope, so I made some uh, changes to the optic here, now we can see, we can resolve that there's some pretty regular structure going on. If I zoom in on that, you can see we're, we're getting better. We're getting closer to the ground truth here. And so this is why resolution is, is critical because we can absolutely just not see stuff uh, that is there, that is, it, it is actually happening in your specimen. And the type of resolution that we're gonna talk about is classic diffraction limited resolution. And I have to distinguish that because now there are these super resolution techniques that allow you to go beyond the, um, uh, the diffraction limit. Every one of those super resolution techniques has a lot of limitations, okay? So it's not that they're like the answer to all of our problems. Um, they're, they're the answer to some people's problems. <laughs> um, but uh, for the most part, you're gonna spend I would say, uh, unless you're a super as person, you're going to mostly be doing diffraction limited microscopy um, in your career. So Abbe defined the diffraction limit. There's a monument to him in Germany. And um, he defined the diffraction limit of microscopy resolution as limited by the wavelength of light. And this is the wavelength of light that is forming the image. And I, I differentiate that because in fluorescence, we're illuminating with a different wavelength as you're here from Riley tomorrow, um, then we're actually imaging. So the, the, the wavelength of light that's forming the image and the maximum angle of light that the lens that we're using is able to collect. And I'll get back to that point. But we have a, a, an equation here and um, we'll also get, I'll also get back to that equation. All right, so why is, resolution limited in the light microscope. The reason why is because of the point spread function. And so to describe the point spread function, to give you an understanding of what the point spread function is, we're first just gonna observe it. We're gonna look at what the point spread function looks like. And then we'll backtrack and talk about why it looks like that. So the point spread function, it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. You have a point source of light and it spreads out in space, okay? And so let's, let's say that this little circle represents a point source of light. And in microscopy, we talk about this as being an infinitely small point, point source of light, right? So it's what we can think about as being way smaller than the resolution limit, right? Just because something is smaller than the resolution limit doesn't mean we can't make an image of it, right? Because we can still detect the light and form an image. But the point spread function is going to define what that image actually looks like. So we, we start with our 
point source of light, and then we put it on the microscope, and what we're going to actually see, and I leave the point there just for reference, but what you're actually going to see in the image is because this is a, 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 an object that's smaller than, than the diffraction limit, you're gonna see a blur, it's gonna be larger, and this is not about magnification, this is about blurring of the image, so it's going to be larger than that point source. And if we uh, contrast enhance here, you can probably see this better over here. Um, if we do a contrast enhancement and just bring up the weaker intensity information in this, in this image, what you'll see is that we have a bright central maxima and then dark and light concentric rings around. Okay. So again, our ground truth is a sphere with defined sharp edges. The best we can do, this is you know the best uh, microscopy we can do here, high res highest resolution microscopy, what we get is this blurred maxima with these bright and dark concentric rings around it. So that's what we're what we observe. And if we do a line scan, you're probably all familiar with what a line scan is, but we, we're gonna draw a line across the image and map the intensity values of, of each point in that image, each pixel. Um, what you'll see is that center maxima is a lot brighter than the first minima. Um, and it has sort of a Gaussian distribution. Again, we'll get into that. Now, the, the point is not just spreading out in XY. So right now what we're looking at is XY is peering down the microscope. The image, is three-dimensional, it exists in 3D. And so we also have to think about what does the point spread function look like in um, the axial view, right? And um, to do that, what, what, I, what we've just done there is demagnify, we've shrunk, shrunk our point down, um, just because you'll see that the, the um, spread of the point axially is, is more so. So we need a little more space on the, on the field of view there. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus we're going to do similar to what um, what you do on a on a confocal. So it's not a confocal image; these are actually simulated images. Um, but we're going to do sort of optical sectioning, right? So we're going to we're going to bring our focus up first in this in this video, and then we're going to move down and collect images and reconstruct on the right hand side what the point spread function looks like in the axial direction. Okay, so we've focused up now. Oh, let's look over here. And now we're moving down through, now we're in the focal plane, right? And then we go all the way through. And so you can see on the, on the right, we built up this uh, three-dimensional or a X, Y, X, Z image of the axial point spread function. And you can see it, it looks quite different. It's beautiful, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and uh, it looks different in a couple of different ways. One is that the maxima is more elongated. And then we've got all these beautiful patterns above and below. All right, so that is what the point spread function looks like. Where does it come from? Let me remind you of a little bit of, of the properties of light. So we can think about light or light behaves um, as a wave. And um, that's simply just a wave. You know, you can think of a wave propagating through space. And a few terms here, the distance of one sort of full cycle of that wave is the wavelength which our eyes see as color. And so that is something, of course, we'll talk about. Wavelength is something you talk about a lot in fluorescence. And then the amplitude of that wave is what our eyes see as brightness. <clears throat> um, you'll see ray diagrams throughout our lectures. And a ray diagram is simply, instead of showing that wave, we're just gonna show an arrow, which represents the, the direction in which that wave is propagating. And then when we start talking about fluorescence, we're gonna talk about light as a particle. So a quantum of energy, and we call that a photon, as I'm sure you know. And photons, <clears throat> as the wavelength of light increases, the amount of energy in an individual photon decreases. Okay, so UV photons um, you know, are why I'm slathered with uh, uh, sunscreen, because they're very high energy and damaging. So um, to understand why the point spread function looks like it does, um, I'll remind you of interference. We have to think about how light waves interact with one another. So if we have two light waves and they're propagating through space, on this slide I show them as you know uh, running um, uh, uh, parallel to one another, 
But in the microscope, let's imagine that they're being focused into the same point, right? So these two pair, uh, light waves focus into the same point. When they, when they get to that point, they're going to interact with one another. And here, these light waves are what we call in phase. So the peaks and the troughs are lined up, right? And what that means is when we add them together, the amplitude, the brightness of that wave is going to increase, right? So we've got our two light waves, we add them together, we have a brighter light wave, makes perfect sense. We call that constructive interference, but we can also get what's called destructive interference. So if we, if we shift one of these, if one of these light waves becomes shifted relative to the other, now the, um, uh, the resultant light wave when we add these together is going to be dimmer, right? So, you know, same two light waves, but they're shifted relative to none of the, one another. Now, when they're focused together, we get less light, a dimmer spot. And that's destructive interference. <clears throat> so the point spread function is a combination of interference and diffraction. Diffraction, you might remember, is, um, well, let me back up. Okay, so to think about diffraction, it's easier not to think about a single wave or a couple of waves propagating through space. It's easiest, I think, to think about a whole bunch of waves lined up in what we call a wave front. So now we've got a bunch of light waves that are traveling together in this wave front. And we, we signify the wave front. Instead of looking at all those light waves, we're just gonna draw these bright and dark lines that represent the amplitude of those waves. So let's take away those waves now and just look at this wave front. And you might remember when you, if you place a pinhole or a slit in front of this wave front, then what, what doesn't happen is you don't get a stream of you know, light coming out. Because of the way light behaves, you get this sort of pattern, right? It, there's this number. And um, the reason why is because we're not going to get super deep into this sort of stuff, but it's the Huygens principle, if you remember that, that light actually doesn't travel in this, the wave like I'm doing it. It travels in a spherical wavelet. Okay. So as it's propagating through space, it's sort of moving in out like this in different directions. So that when you put that pinhole in front, if that pinhole is the size of a single light wave, then that light wave will not just go straight through, it will diffract and we get a pattern like this. You might remember the double slit experiment. This is the experiment that really, you know, um, uh, uh, showed diffraction. And uh, so what we've done here is just put another slit. So now we've got two slits or two pinholes where two light waves can pass through. So let's pop another one on there. And you can see that now these, the, the diffracted light of, of those light waves, which is passing through those pinholes or aperture, the slip, um, are uh, interfering with one another. So instead of seeing just sort of those two patterns overlaid, we start to see this interference. We see these light and dark areas appear. So for example, we have this um, at the top, we have an area where the amplitude has decreased. Right? Um, and then we have the area where it looks sort of same and another area where it's decreased. And so this is the result of those two diffracted waves interfering with one another. And so the point spread function is a product of diffraction and interference. So this is happening in the microscope. You have a wave front that's propagating through the microscope out of the objective lens. Um, and the objective lens is the main for image forming lens as we will talk about. And there's an aperture in the back of that lens. And so the light passes out of the aperture and that's where most of this diffraction occurs, it occurs other places, but, um, and so as the light passes out of that aperture, we have multiple wave fronts now or diffracted wave fronts that are interfering with one another. And the resultant pattern is what we were looking at, okay? So we've got this bright central maxima where there's the most constructive interference, the, the, the highest amount of constructive constructive interference. This one's better for the window. Um, and you can see uh, the, the um, destructive interference is a little more constructive. And so what all that's really happening is the light is just blurring out, right? 
But because of interference, you get this nice, what we call airy disc pattern. This is called the airy disc, where you have that bright central maxima and then the minima and et cetera. Is that clear enough? <clears throat> Just to put this in the context of a microscope, um, we've got on this cartoon a point source of light on the left. The objective lens, the main image forming lens, is going to collect some of the light. So if you imagine that point source is a fluorophore, it's spitting out photons, or you know, fluorophore is bound to an organelle, spitting out photons in all directions. We're just going to be able to collect some limited amount with that lens. And that light is going to be focused into an image. And what we're looking at here, try to do this with the mouse. What we're looking at here is two light waves, light wave A and light wave B. And we have the undiffracted and diffracted components. So what's happening is, is light wave A and light wave B are being refocused or being focused into an image. And the majority of that light constructively interferes at the point in the image that, that corresponds to the position of that point in reality. So we get the brightest center uh, a, a peak of that maxima here, where we have the most constructive interference. As the light move, as we move farther away from that center, we get increasingly destructive interference, if you will. And here we've reached the point we, where we have maximum destructive interference. And so we get that dark ring. And if we move a little bit out more, we're gonna get more construct, a little bit more constructive interference. So we start to see a larger amplitude. And that's simply because um, the light waves, as I showed in that destructive interference cartoon, they are now um, shifted relative to one another because of the distance that they've traveled. So light wave A and light wave B, when they, when they recombine here, they have both traveled the same distance. So they, if they've started off in phase, they're gonna wind up in, in phase and you're gonna get that constructive interference. We're out here, light wave A and light wave B, the diffracted components have traveled different distances. And the minima here is the place at which you get a shift in wave in those two wave front, uh, waves, such that when you add them together, you get complete destructive interference. Okay, so that's where this beautiful pattern comes from that um, I have tattooed in my back. You're welcome to ask to see it later. Um, <laughs> all right, so <clears throat> when we do when we're doing microscopy, we're generally thinking about that maxima. Right, you've got all these beautiful patterns around them, but we're usually focusing on that maxima where, where the majority of the intensity is. And so if this is our point source of light and this is our axial point spread function, we can see that it's blurred out quite a bit. And um, you know, I gave you a simple explanation there thinking about the lateral resolution, but you know, obviously in the axial direction, we see all these beautiful patterns that's all interference and diffraction, a result of interference and diffraction as well. And if you map out those um, light waves, you'll see that the maxima is elongated in Z. Yes, please. Yeah, um, there are things that affect it. Oh, sorry. Um, what, what can we do to, to um, increase or decrease the destructive interference? When we're thinking about something like fluorescence, um, and I wanna say that because there, there are transmitted light methods where you, or the aim is to do that so that you get better, better contrast, things like phase and VIP. Um, but in the context of fluorescence, which, which we're talking about in this course, um, you're just kind of stuck with this. This is just physics. There's not much you can do to, to you know, influence um, where, it, where it happens. However, the angle of diffraction is wavelength dependent. And so we have that that we can control. Shorter wavelengths are gonna give you better resolution as we'll see when we look at that equation. Um, and, and I'll also say that there's lots of things you can do to um, wind up way worse than this, right? So, so the goal is like to get it as good as it can be. Um, and that is a struggle enough. Right, because this is this is all theoretical, and in reality, as you'll see, it gets a little mucky. If we look at a line, a, a, a three-dimensional image here, um, or uh, maxima, of, or sorry, of the maxima, what you'll see is that 
that center maxima, the brightest part, as I said earlier, is much brighter than that first um, uh, bright ring. And so this is why we generally just focus on the maxima. Those, those rings are there, but we don't, we don't generally talk about them or see them because they're very dim relative to the maxima. So they're actually hard to detect in your microscope. You have something really bright and something really, really dim. So it's hard to detect them. If you do see them, you're doing great, right? But it's quite typical that you won't see them. And we're going to, one of the things, Uri went right to the biological samples, but the samples I'm excited about that you're going to look like, look at, are fluorescent beads. Okay, so today and tomorrow, you're going to look at fluorescent microspheres. So they're just little tiny point sources of light that emit photons. So you're going to see this stuff using this known, I like them because they're known. Uri thinks he knows what is going on in this cochlea that he's labeled, but really he has no idea what's in that. <laughs> Um, well, you know, you know, you label this thing and that thing, but you don't really know what the ground truth is. The beads let us know the ground truth, right? So we know their size, we know their wavelength, et cetera. Um, so they really reveal what the microscope is doing to the biology or to the image of your biology. Okay. Now I told you, we've been talking about point spread function. We've been talking about what's happening with a single point source of light, but I told you that resolution is being able to distinguish between two point sources. So let's add another one. And at this point, we have to start thinking about criteria for resolution. Um, each point source is imaged as a Gaussian. That maxima has a Gaussian distribution. And so the question is, sort of how far apart do things have to be before you can distinguish those two Gaussians as separate from one another? So for example, we have two point sources here. Right, and they're separated by some distance. And what we're not going to see when we're imaging, when we've labeled everything with, you know, all of our protein of interest, say, with the same floor for, what we're not going to be able to do in that case is look at the individual point spread functions, right? The individual Gaussians, they're going to be imaged together, so they're going to add together. So this is what we're going to see. So the question, the resolution criteria question is, well, how do I, how am I gonna, like how far apart do they have to be before I can be confident that they're two objects, right? Now, clearly if those Gaussians were, you know, across the room from each other, we can be confident, but that's not the resolution criteria we use. We actually use a resolution criteria in which um, we get this sort of uh, curve on the right and I'll get back to that. Um, but just so it's clear, why this is an issue, why, why the Gaussian makes a, a difference here. This is a, a little, I, you'll see I show lots of simulations from Tally. He's great at making simulations um, as well as many other things. But um, what, what you're seeing here is two point sources of light. And one of the variables in that equation on um, Abbey's monument is uh, the numerical aperture of the objective lens, which I will get back to tomorrow. Um, and when we vary that number, we are increasing the resolution as it, when it goes up and decreasing the resolution as it goes down. And what that means is the Gaussian is spreading out. And so we can see that in this movie, as we decrease the resolution, the Gaussians blur out and they start to blur together. And at the end, you know, we, we only see one big spot. So this is a high resolution imaging system and then we have a low resolution imaging system. So it's really all about the size of that point spread function. There are multiple criteria that people that have been developed and uh, to define the resolution limit of your instrument. And here are three that you'll see out there. Um, so the sparrow criterion on the right, that one's, you just got a little bit of a flat top of those Gaussians. Abbe, you've got a little, little dip. That's the one that's on the, um, uh, on the monument, what we mostly use is Rayleigh, okay, the Rayleigh criterion. And the Rayleigh criterion states that if the maxima of one point spread function overlays the first minima of the neighboring point spread function, then you will get a dip in intensity between the two. And then we can say with that criteria that we have resolved those structures. Now, that's fine if they're fluorescent bees and we know they're fluorescent bees. But when we have an unknown sample, a biological sample on the microscope, 
understand that this is the resolution criteria we are using? And how much confidence would you have in your biologic sample to say that curve is two objects? I hope not much, <laughs> right? And so just keep in mind that the theoretical resolution limit, this is what it tells you. It tells you that if you have two objects that are in reality separate from one another, you'll see a dip in intensity between them. You won't clearly distinguish them, is that correct? Um, okay, so just get to the Rayleigh equations. So these different criteria use different equations to, to give you the distance by which the two objects have to be separated. So the lateral um, equation that we use here for Rayleigh is the minimum distance that two objects must be separated by in order to resolve them is equal to a constant 0.61, this is the Rayleigh part, um, times the wavelength of light that is forming the image divided by this property of the objective lens, which we'll all define more clearly later, the numerical aperture. The axial resolution has its own equation. Things are different in the axial direction, right? Um, and <clears throat> for the axial direction, we have, again, it's minimum distance. And just to be clear what that means, in, in axial resolution, what we're talking about is you have point sources um, or objects stop, stacked on top of one another, right? So you're doing a Z series and you're trying to see if they're in separate focal planes, right? Um, but it's the same concept. There, you have this Gaussian blur, and in the axial direction, it's blurred even more, right? And so the axial resolution is always worse than the lateral resolution. And that is defined as, again, the minimum distance that those objects have to be separated from one another in Z is equal to two times the wavelength of light. Now we add in the refractive index of the immersion media, which we'll get back to later. Um, divided by the numerical aperture of the objective lens, this time squared. So the numerical aperture is even more important when thinking about axial, it's always important, but it's even more important for axial resolution. So if we plug those numbers into, or if we plug numbers into those equations based on wavelength here, and assuming that we're using a 1.4 NA oil immersion objective, which is gonna be your standard high resolution objective lens, that most confocals are gonna have uh, uh, an option of 1.4 NA. Then what we see is for, for green light, we've got a lateral resolution of about a quarter micron and an axial resolution of about three quarter microns. So that's pretty pathetic, right? Like we're looking at things, you know, an individual protein is gonna be in the, in the nanometer to tens of nanometer range. So we're talking about way worse resolution than the objects that we're actually interested in in many cases. All right, so we talked about what the microscope does to a single point source of light, talked about what it does to two point sources of light, but you probably have more than two that you're interested in. You're gonna be looking at your biological specimen that you have labeled with a bunch of different point sources of light, which are fluorophores. And so the way to think about what the point spread, the phenomenon of the point spread function does to the image, the optical image of your sample, um, this is what's called a convolution operation, if you're a mathy person, if not, don't worry about it, um, where every point source of light in your specimen is going to be convolved with this point spread function. And you can think of that as for each point spread function, you stamp on top of it, or sorry, for each point source of light, you stamp on top of it a point spread function. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so this can be demonstrated in a, in a couple of different ways. And um, here, what I'm going to show you are images of fluorescent bees, my face, um, that are imaged with a high NA lens, and so that the diameter of the airy disc is about 450 nanometers. And here are three different fluorescent bees that have uh, different size, different size fluorescent bees, and they're in the micron range, so they're well above the resolution limit of the system. And if we do line scans across each of these bees and we plot them, we'll see a couple of different things. First of all, again, in reality, these are microspheres that have a sharp finite edge, right? But because every point source of light that is making up that microsphere is blurred, the edges are going to be blurred, right? And so um, we see that sort of sloped blurred edge of each bead. And we can also see the difference in, in size, right? The 2.5 is 
smaller than the six, just like we would expect. Um, and in fact, we can get a, quite an accurate measurement of that bead. And the way that we measure the, the width of this sort of Gaussian curve is to look at the full width, the full width of it at half maximal intensity. So full width at half max, we'll be saying that phrase. And that just means pick the, you know, the, the half of the maximum intensity and measure the width of that curve. And so you do that measurement here, you're gonna be, you're gonna find that it's quite accurate. When you go beyond the diffraction limit, below the diffraction limit. So now we have fluorescent beads, again, in this circumstance with this optical setup and wavelength of light, the width of the airy disc, the, the, the um, point spread function, would be about 450 nanometers. And so what that means is that that is the smallest point source in your optical image. That's the smallest point source you can possibly have in your optical image. So if we have a fluorescent bead that is 200 nanometers, but the microscope is only capable of, of uh, creating a point spread function that is 450 nanometers, we're never gonna be able to accurately measure the width of these beads. They are below the resolution limit of our microscope. And so they appear as point spread functions. And so even though that 200 nanometer bead is twice as big as the 100 nanometer bead, they look very similar, right? And if we do that same line scan, we can't distinguish between them. So resolution is an issue when you're imaging diffraction limit or can be an issue if you're, if you're imaging diffraction limited spots, spots that are in your samples that are smaller than the resolution limit, you must understand that they are, they're not going to appear at their actual size if they're below that resolution limit, they're going to appear larger. And so for each point source, this is what's happening. The point spread function is blurring every single point source by this amount that is defined by the wavelength of light and properties of the objective lens, the numerical aperture. So let's put this in the context of a um, biological sample. Let's say we have a couple of 25 nanometer width microtubules. So microtubules, you guys probably know this, made up of tubule and polymers, and the width of each individual microtubule is 25 nanometers. So that's much lower than the resolution limit, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to label them with a fluorophore. So for each monomer, we're going to put a fluorophore on there. And we're going to then take that sample and put it on the microscope and form an optical image of it. And we know now that each of those point sources is going to be convolved with the point spread function. So each one is going to be blurred out into that Gaussian. And so the resultant image is as if we stamp that maxima, that green spot there is supposed to represent the maxima. If we stamp that on top of every single point source, this is what you're going to see when you look in the microscope. Right, so we can see sort of all these things come together here. The width of that microtubule is inaccurate. The microscope is reporting an inaccurate width here. And in the center there where those microtubules are closer than the diffraction limit, you can't distinguish them as separate from one another. So if you wanted to know if they were side by side or crossing, you can't. Right? Yeah, there we go. Tragic. Now, <laughs> Those point spread functions I've been showing you are theoretical. Um, and that is certainly what's happening. But you are going to put biology in the optical path of my microscope, which really screws it up. OK? My microscope performs perfectly until you put your biology on it. <laughs> um, your biology is you know, a chunk of varying refractive indices and light scattering materials and light absorbing materials. It's a disaster. So you're going to put um, your sample on the microscope. These are, are some cells expressing GFP tubulin or some fluorescent protein tubulin. And we've got a single focal plane. And then we've got our axial um, uh, uh, views as well. And you can see that the point spread function is happening here. So if we zoom in on this little guy, and then we compare it to the theoretical one, right? You can see, I hope you can see, did I put some? Oh, I took the arrows off. Um, I, I think you can see that we have an elongated central maxima, right? And you can sort of see that they're going off in these directions similar to what we have in the theoretical point spread function. But I like to show this because emphasize theory is different than practice here. 
it is very difficult to achieve diffraction limited microscopy unless you're imaging beads. <laughs> So it is very difficult. And so you have to understand that your specimen is limiting what the microscope can actually achieve. So it is very rarely the case that you plug numbers into a, your resolution equation and you can make the assumption that that is the actual resolution that you're getting in the microscope. Um, and this is just the reality of, of um, working with biological specimens. All right, so we've been talking about the formation of the optical image. But you don't make measurements on the optical image. You might view it through the eyepiece, but what you do ultimately is make measurements on your digital image, right? And so we are going to start with our specimen in the microscope. We're going to form an optical image of it, and then we're going to project that optical image onto some sort of detector, photon detector, like a camera. And Tally tomorrow morning will tell you about how those sorts of um, detectors work. And that detector is going to the output of that detector is going to be a digital image. And so that is the information we have. We have an optical image and we create a digital image of it. And so the information that is available to you that you can use to make measurements of your sample, there's two kinds of information. There's spatial information. So you've magnified your image onto this detector. And the result is a digital image, which you probably know is made up of picture elements, which we call pixels, right? So each pixel in the image is going to, depending on the magnification and the size of that, that pixel in the detector, it's going to represent some finite part of your uh, size of your sample, right? So we can determine this pixel is equal to X nanometers in our sample, for example. So we have spatial information. We can measure between pixels and uh, uh, measure distances within our sample. The other piece of information that is present in that digital image is intensity information. So each pixel in that image has assigned to it an intensity value, also called the grayscale value. There's a lot of places, I mean, this is rampant in science, right? But in microscopy where there's multiple names for the same thing. So hopefully that won't get confusing, but um, uh, intensity values, grayscale values, same thing, digital numbers even is another one that you'll hear. But uh, what those numbers represent is they, hopefully, we need them to, uh, correlate in some way to the number of photons that are present in that part of the specimen, that area of the specimen represented by that pixel. And so I think you can see, even if you can't resolve the, the individual numbers here, you can see that the numbers are greater, larger in the area where there is intensity information in the optical image. and we want the detectors that we use, that Tally will tell you about tomorrow, to be linear detectors such that when the number of photons or as the number of photons that hit the detector increases, the intensity value that the digital image reports to you also increases in a linear fashion. And if that's the case, if, that, if your detector is behaving in that way, then we can make pixel intensity comparisons and we can say this is brighter than that, okay? All right, signal noise ratio. I told you this is my favorite. Somebody yell at me if I'm gonna go way over. I don't know what time it is. Yeah, well, I'll talk all day if you let me. All right, so <laughs> um, signal to noise ratio, so important. I'm gonna talk signal about signal to noise ratio, and then I'm gonna talk about background a little bit too, because that is there's a relationship there. And then we're going to tie in resolution because they're all related, ultimately. But first, I want to define signal and noise and background um, the way I like to define them. Um, signal are the photons that you want to measure. So let's say that you are measuring the intensity of microtubules in that image that I showed you, um, GFP. Uh, tubulin is being expressed and they're polymerizing into microtubules and you want to make some measurements on the microtubules, right? So the signal that you are interested in, in that case, are the photons being emitted by the fluorophores that are, are, that are on the polymerized microtubule, right? That is the signal. That's when I say signal, that's what we mean, signal. And if we, this is either simulated images, um, but if you do a line scan across 
the image, you can look at the fluorescence intensity and see that it goes up and down and it's black in the background in this case, because we only have signal represented in this simulated image. Now, if we add background to the image, backgrounds are any photons that your detector detects that you're not interested in, that are not signal. And in my, and they come from lots of different places, but my, in my example of the cell expressing tubulin, you also have tubulin with a fluorophore on it that stays a monomer. So you have this population of monomers that have fluorophores on them within the cytoplasm. And they're emitting photons and you're collecting them and they're becoming part of the digital image, but you're not interested in those. Those are background photons, right? And so this is why we do background subtraction, right? Um, and I'll get to that. But if we add background to the, or I should say background adds to the signal. So here in our simulation, we've added backgrounds, uniform backgrounds, a uniform number to each pixel in the background. And so what you see is that curve increase, the, or, or all of the numbers sort of move up. So background adds to the signal. And because it adds to the signal, this is why if you can carefully measure the background, the intensity of the background, you can subtract it from the intensity values in your image, and that will leave you with the signal that you're actually, actually interested in. <clears throat> Noise is a fluctuation in intensity values in the pixels, okay? So that's very different than adding a value, it's a fluctuation. So you can't subtract out noise. You'll, you'll hear people say that, subtracting the noise. You can't subtract a variance from an individual pixel, right? Um, and so what noise looks like is this. You see that um, we still have the background here, but we've added noise. And so what you see is this greater fluctuation in the intensity of values across that line. Here. So this is a, a, a little cartoon here showing you what noise looks like. And so again, it's another simulation. <laughs> Simulations are really helpful here because we can parse out these things that you can't really parse out in your actual images. Um, so what we have here is a no signal at all in the background. And we have um, a, a, a square in the center that is perfectly, perfectly uniform intensity and reality. And what we've done here is we formed an image of that with our microscope and collected an image with our, our digital detector. And now we're looking at the digital image of that simple sample. And what you can see is we have a nice, um, or sorry, we have a line scan across here. I have to do this over here. And what you can see is that at the edge here, we have an increase in intensity. And that is our signal. The difference between the background and the sort of average value here is what we generally assign as signal. This fluctuation that you see is the noise. And the, the, the extent of that fluctuation, we're going to talk about where it comes from and how to deal with it and such, but it can vary a ton, right? How much that fluctuation is. And um, what I want you to notice about that is what we can think of here, the reason why things are, are moving and blinking is what we're, we're doing here is not looking at a single image, but we're collecting multiple images. It's like if you're doing a live acquisition in the microscope. So we see images, you know, one after the other popping up. And what you can see if you look at either the image or, or the, the, the um, curve here is that the fluctuation in intensity is in every individual image, it fluctuates from pixel to pixel, right? And then when you collect one image and then you collect another image, if you look at the corresponding pixel in each of those images, it's also fluctuating temporally, right? So it's fluctuating spatially from pixel to pixel in each individual image and in each pixel in the uh, images that you're collecting over time, you see that fluctuation as well. So this is a source of imprecision, right? Because we're gonna have we have some variation in the signal that is due to noise and not the instrument. So we will, or sorry, um, not the ground truth. And so we will talk about the sources of noise. I'm gonna tell you about one of them today and Tally's gonna tell you about another tomorrow, the main sources. <laughs>
what we generally talk about when we're thinking about these properties is the signal to noise ratio, because that's really what's important. How bright is your signal relative to the amount of noise you have? So you can have a shit ton of noise as long as you have even more shit tons of signal, right? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I was doing pretty good without the swearing. There's two primary sources of noise that we'll talk about. There's the signal itself, and I'll tell you about that now. And there's noise from that is generated by the detector that Tally will tell you about tomorrow. Um, when we make intensity measurements, what are we measuring? I'm waiting for an answer. Sorry? Signal, but what's the actual unit? Photons, right. Now we generally report them in AUs, arbitrary units. It amazes me that we get away with that, right? <laughs> I like to, if you follow me on Twitter every year, I like to tell you my birthday in arbitrary units. I'm currently 21 arbitrary units that have been for a while. Um, but yeah, we use these arbitrary, meaningless um, units, but what we're actually measuring is photons, right? And so because we're measuring photons, the behavior of the photons matters here in our ability to measure them. And the photon flux, the, the, you know, the flux of photons that's moving through space and hitting your detector, it's stochastic. And what that means when you try it, when you, you are counting a stochastic process, a stochastic event, what you get are uh, a distribution in that count, a, a variation in that count that is equal to the square root of, in this case, the number of photons that you counted. So this is just basic like counting statistics when we're trying to count a stochastic event and the flux of photons is stochastic. So this is another sort of fundamental limitation. We have this fundamental limitation of diffraction limited resolution, and we have this fundamental limitation of, of um, what we call Poisson noise, the square root of the number of photons that you detect is always going to be present there. This has lots of noise. We generally like to refer to it as Poisson noise, but you also hear it called shot noise or photon noise or photonic noise or signal noise. It's all the same thing. Most commonly they're called, it's called Poisson noise or shot noise. So what is this? What is this Poisson noise mean? Or where does it come from? So here we have a light source. Okay, and it can be any light source. We're showing you a light bulb here, but it can be a fluorophore, any light source. This light source is spitting out photons. And what we would like is for those photons to march out of that light source in perfect order, right? Such that at any point, if we collect the photons for some unit of time, which we call our exposure time when we use this camera, right? So when we collect those photons for a unit of time, each exposure will get the same number. That is the world that we would like to live in but we don't live in that kind of world um, <laughs> because the photon flux is stochastic. And so what that means is like cars passing on the highway, if you count for any given time frame, you're going to get a different number than the next time frame. And the variance that you will see because it's a stochastic event is equal to the square root of the number of things that you counted in this case photons. Okay, so this, this is where that variance comes from. And again, fundamental limitation, you can't make this go away. Okay. You can be smart about dealing with it, but you can't make it go away. Just to kind of uh, give you some more ways to look at this and think about it, here we have another simulation on the left is the ground truth, which are these squares against a black background. Now they're in varying, varying intensity and size. And on the right, we have added Poisson noise. There's no Poisson noise, and then, we, and then we have added in the simulation Poisson noise on the right. So that's, you're stuck with that. And that is a source of imprecision. But you know what, the, what that variance is. It's the square root of the number of photons. So you can estimate it. Hard to measure exactly because you don't really know exactly how many photons, but you can estimate it. Um, again, just driving this home. So if the, the reality in your specimen is that there is an average of 100 photons, right? And you plot that. This is what you're going to see for that sample that has an average value of 100 photons per you know, unit time that you're measuring them. If you plot the individual measurements, you will have this distribution. 
with that distribution of Newton's equal to the square root of the number of photons. So what you don't want to do is assign this to something going on in your biology. This is the fundamental limitation of your measurement and not due to the biology. One of the most important tools that you have in dealing with Poisson noise is the fact that Poisson noise is equal to the square root of the number of photons. So if you collect more photons, your signal to noise ratio, just thinking about Poisson noise, the ratio of the, of the photons to the square root of the photons is going to improve the more photons you collect. So this is one of the reasons why your images look so much nicer to your eyes when your sample is bright or you take a longer exposure time, right? Um, and so we're gonna talk quite a bit tomorrow about think practical things that you can do to get more signal to deal with Poisson noise. Um, yeah, so this is demonstrating um, uh, an increase in intensity. Maybe we use brighter fluorophores, maybe we use higher or, or better lenses, maybe we used um, longer exposure times, higher intensity. In some way, we collected more photons, uh, increasing number of photons from right, left to right here. And you can see just by increasing the amount of photons, we get a decrease in the amount of noise and the increase in the signal to noise ratio. So the, I think it's probably clear why this, this is a problem, but let's, let's think about it carefully. Um, you got to go back to this one over here, the information. So these are fluorescent beads um, that are, um, there's two different populations of beads in this image. There's a very bright bead, and then it's surrounded by some beads that are much dimmer. And the image on the left, has a high signal to noise ratio relative to the image on the way. And you can see that one of the effects of the noise here is we can no longer see the weak intensity. We have lost them, they are lost in the noise. So in this case, the variance in intensity due to Poisson noise and other sources of noise is greater than the intensity of those beats in the image. So you can't detect them, they're gone. Right? So this is not resolution. They didn't disappear the way the pores on the diaphragm disappeared. They disappeared for another reason. They disappeared because of the low signal in one case. Um, so we have to worry about whether we can detect something, right? Whether whether what we're interested in is above the amount of noise in the image. Um, and another way to think about how noise affects the image is to think about um, the minimum detectable change in signal that you can that you can measure in your image. So here we have a sort of a step function, right? Where our sample is increasing in intensity across the screen here. And there's a representation of what that image would look like. Here we have no noise, right? We can see that perfect step function across the sample. If we add a little bit of noise here, we can see that we can still see that there's a sort of jump in intensity, much noisier signal. It doesn't look as nice and clean, but we can still see what's going on. We can still kind of make some measurements and say that, yeah, it just doubled in intensity from the first step and now it's going up another step. We can identify another equal step, right? So there's some good information we can eke out in here. We know that that variance is because of noise, so we're not going to pay much attention to it. Um, but what if we? Do you, what if you're you know, not doing things optimally or your sample's kind of crap or whatever it is and you have a lot worse signal to noise ratio? Now we cannot detect those, those that stepwise change in intensity anymore. We've lost the ability to see that small change that uh, change in intensity. And so this is really, you know, can, can really skew your results as well. If you measured this, you would just say there was a, you know, a flat and speed step. Coming back to resolution, that resolution equation gives you the optical resolution of your microscope, which I've already said can be limited by the biology, but it's also limited by signal to noise ratio. So here we have a, another simulated images of point sources that have relatively low noise. It's a decent signal to noise ratio, and we can see those 
um, spots, we could do better, right? We could have higher signal noise ratio, but it's not too bad. Here is a, a lower signal to noise ratio. So we've added some additional noise to this image. And I think you can see if we do a line scan across, it's particularly um, uh, visible here, right? Where we can see that the dip in intensity on the image on the left in those two beads, we can, we can resolve those despite the noise. But when we add noise, we can no longer resolve them, okay? So our ability to resolve two objects can be lost in the noise, right? So if you want good resolution, you gotta pay attention to signal to noise ratio as well. And if you want precise measurements, you've gotta pay attention to signal to noise ratio. There is also a relationship here with background, background fluorescence. Um, and so the way I like to explain this, because we haven't talked about detectors yet, as you learn from Tally that detectors, you know, collect photons. And I'll explain how that works. Um, or they, yeah, they, well, I'll just call it collecting photons. So, but for today, we're just going to think this simply. We're going to think about a vessel, um, <laughs> a morning vessel here. So this is a vessel and we're going to fill it up with pho photons. So we've got our little um a photon collector here and so imagine your sample you know spitting out photons so you've got the stream of photons that is filling up this detector and what we have so here is your your sample is mostly signal so most of the photons that are hitting the detector are coming from the part of the sample that you're interested in the signal right? The microtubules in that example I gave earlier. That's most of the photons. There's a few background photons in there too. So when you fill up your detector with photons, um, they're going to be mostly signal photons. Now, this, this detector has a limited capacity to hold photons. You can fill up this coffee cup and then you're done, right? If you fill it up anymore, you're not going to maintain you're not going to hold on to them so there's a maximum capacity for the detector and so if we fill it up with this flux of photons that's mostly signal and just a little bit of background but then we have a different kind of sample and this sample has high background and low signal so you've got a lot of background photons just a few signal photons in there and we fill up the detector with those photons we've got the same number of of photons in each of these scenarios, right? We fill up our detector with the most photons it can collect. We've just got mostly signal on the left and mostly background on the right. Now, Poisson noise is the square root of the number of photons. It doesn't know if they're background photons or signal photons. Photons are photons, okay? So the Poisson noise is the same in these two cases, but your signal is much lower, the amount of signal photons you've collected is much lower. And so even if we do a background subtraction, which we must do, because in neither of these cases does the number of photons represent the signal. They both have background photons. So you have to, outside of this area where there is signal, define as best you can the amount of background photons and subtract them. And so if we subtract those out, if we X them out, we're left, as I said, with much fewer signal photons on the, on the right. But the Poisson noise is the same between the two. And so what we wind up with is the same amount of Poisson noise, but lower signal. So the presence of that background decreases our signal to noise ratio. The noise is the same. The signal is that, that we've collected is lower. And so background decreases your signal to noise ratio. Um, and, you know, an example of this, um, this is not what the sky looks like in Boston, but if you're out in the middle of nowhere where you don't have a lot of background, you know, street lights and such, at night you can see the stars beautifully. In the city, you can't see them as well because there's too many background photons. And in the daytime, you can't see them at all because there's way too many background photons. So those, those are lost in the noise. And again, a simulation. Here we have a sample that has background, but we haven't added any Poisson noise to it. And here the background, it's not a problem, right? We can still see their objects very clearly. We can measure the background and, and subtract it out and we'd be good to go, 
but we have Poisson noise. Poisson noise is there. And so if we add that, you can see that the signal to noise ratio decreases substantially just because of the Poisson noise. Um, this is a sort of real life example of this, if you will. So here I took um, fluorescent beads, of course, this is all I know. Um, fluorescent beads, and they're in a solution on, on the left here that in A that doesn't have any, or doesn't have substantial background, just like a buffer. Um, and I did a line scan across one of the beads, and you can see that Gaussian curve that we would expect. Um, and I set my exposure time and, and illumination intensity such that I was collecting um, a, a lot of photons, but not saturating, right? Not filling up the, the coffee cup is not overflowing. Um, and then I petted some fluorophore into the background. Now that fluorophore, that background fluorescence is going to add to that signal. So everything is super bright. And in order to collect the image in B, I had to decrease the exposure time and intensity of illumination so that the coffee cup didn't overflow, right? And so now we have the same sort of similar maximum intensity, but the difference between the background and the signal is much less. And even if we do a background subtraction, as you can see in C, we do reveal the signal that's left there that is very noisy because we haven't selected as much signal. So background stinks and out of focus fluorescence is a major source of background in biological samples. So this is simply the fact that when you are imaging with a standard fluorescence microscope or a confocal, you are, it, you are illuminating all the fluorophores throughout your sample. The light is going through the entire biological sample and you're exciting all the fluorophores, through, well, not all the fluorophores, exciting fluorophores throughout the entire axial Z volume of your sample. You're only focused on a particular plane and that's what you're interested in. You're interested in that focal plane. Um, but fluorophores that exist above and below that focal plane are gonna be excited and emit photons. And those photons are gonna to contribute to the background. So out of focus fluorescence is a source of background and it can be such a big source of background in like a thick piece of tissue with a lot of fluorophore in it that you can't see anything, right? And this is um, a, a limitation but uh, to your resolution as well, right? Um, if, you, if you have a lot of background, a very noisy image, you're not gonna be able to resolve as I showed you earlier. And so the purpose of confocal is to reduce the amount of out of focus fluorescence and that you actually collect from your sample. And Uri will explain to you how the microscope is designed in order to do that very clever little tricks that we use to reduce, dramatically reduce the amount of out of focus fluorescence that we collect. And this is really, sorry? You sure are. <laughs> All right, well, I'll explain it to you after this. All right, so, so this is why we do confocal. We do not do, con now theoretically, you can seek out a little bit more resolution from a confocal microscope theoretically, like your theoretical resolution limit gets a tiny bit better. Not much biology is gonna jump out at you because you increase it by the amount of confocal can increase it. However, you, if you've lost resolution because of out of focus fluorescence, the confocal will let you recover that resolution. So you will get closer to the theoretical value that the microscope is capable of, right? So this is really the purpose of out of focus fluorescence. And I like to, to emphasize purpose of reducing the out-of-focus fluorescence with a confocal. And I like to emphasize that because you often hear people say, I need higher resolution, so I want a confocal. Well, that's only you're only going to get higher resolution with a confocal in a practical way if you have out-of-focus fluorescence, right? So if you have a nice thin sample with no background fluorescence and you stick it on a, on a confocal, you know, it's not going to get you much. And there are downsides to everything in life, including confocal microscopy. And, and Ari will talk about the kind of compromises that you have to make when you choose these different um, techniques. But this is really what we're trying to do. Get rid of the out-of-focus fluorescence, increase our signal to noise ratio so that we can recover the resolution that that out-of-focus fluorescence um, uh, causes us to lose. And then last, I just have a couple of slides on the concept of sampling. Marie's going to talk a bit more about this, but I just want us to think together about the concept of sampling and how it applies to microscopy. 
So sampling, as you probably know, sampling is selecting a subset of the whole in, or a, a, subset, a subset in order to represent the whole. So anything we do in, in, in science, we're not measuring everything, we're measuring a subset. And in microscopy, we sample in a couple of different ways. Oh, sorry, let me describe this in another way. Um, in microscopy and in many things we're trying to measure, there is some continuous change in, in our case signal, but we're going to take discrete measurements of that change, okay? And so for example, we have our optical image that the optics in the microscope generates, and we're gonna project that onto our digital detector and our output is gonna be a digital image. And so we are essentially sampling that continuous optical image with these discrete detector elements that we will know as pixels in the digital image. So we're sampling that optical image with the digital image, or sorry, with the pixels in the digital image, right? So that's a type of sampling that we're doing in microscopy. And again, just defining it now, we'll talk about how to think about it when you're actually doing work on the microscope. And this matters, right? The sampling matters is another way you can lose resolution if you're not optimally sampling. So here we have, a decreasing rate of sampling. So in, in this case, the pixels are getting larger in the image. And we, we, we pretty quickly here from, from left to right, lose resolution in the digital image, even though the optical image has the resolution, we lose it at that step of collecting the image. We also, I don't have a slide for it, but we, we, um, we sample in the XY direction and pixel. And we sample in the Z direction by moving that focus motor, right? The interval between um, focal planes that we collect to do our three-dimensional image. So there's two types of spatial sampling that we do when we do a three-dimensional image. Um, but we also do, when we get to live imaging, we're gonna temporally sample as well. So how often when you collect an, a time-lapse, how often do you collect an image, right? And this is important to think about. You don't want to just pull a number out of a hat. I'll take an image every five seconds, done. Um, because it really matters, the frequency with which you measure the signal is, or we'll talk about in a little more detail. So the ground truth is we have some continuous change. So let's say that we have a, you know, a, a, we're measuring a cell and that cell is changing intensity over time, right? Or you could think of it as you have an object that's moving around the field of view right, over time. And so if you want to track that intensity change or that movement change, it matters how often you make that measurement, right? So here we've made three discrete measurements. And if we reconstruct our um, change here, we're, we're really far off from the ground truth because we haven't sampled that temporarily enough to, um, to reconstruct that. And so if we sample a little bit more here, now we get closer to the ground truth. And so the rate at which you sample, the pixel size that you use in your image, or the, the pixel size in the image, and the um, distance between focal planes in your, in your confocal stack, Z-series stack, and in a live experiment, how often you collect a time point. All of those collectively are going to um, you know, limit, potentially limit, the, um, your ability to, to measure these things accurately. And I think that is, yes. So just, so what we've covered here again, just to review is um, our, we have a resolution limit that we're up against. We have signal to noise ratio that we have to worry about and sampling. And all three of these you need to be thinking about if you want to make an accurate and precise measurement of your biological sample. And we're here to talk about confocal because the um, out-of-focus fluorescence compromises both the resolution and the signal-to-noise ratio. So in a sample that has out-of-focus fluorescence, we're gonna benefit greatly by reducing the amount of out-of-focus uh, fluorescence that we collect. And that is it. So happy to take any